Let's say that me and you are playing a word association game where you say something and I then have to say the first thing that comes into my head. If you were to say Metal Gear Rising, then I'd immediately say music. I don't think I'd be wrong to assume that quite a few other people would have the exact same response too. Soundtracks almost always enhance some element of an experience, but enhance feels like too weak a word when it comes to discussing Metal Gear Rising. The soundtrack doesn't just enhance the experience, it's a central pillar that makes it what it is. It's lightning fast and full of dynamic action, perfectly reflecting what's happening on screen as Raiden reduces everything he comes across to pieces. But something that I feel gets a bit left behind is that the music does so much more than just match and accompany the exhilarating gameplay. The composition and implementation of some tracks do some really interesting things to elevate the storytelling of the game. It's a lot smarter than you might otherwise think, and today we're going to talk about why that is. In the vast majority of stories, there's a main character or protagonist. They're the one we as the audience follow throughout the story, and when it comes to video games, they're usually the good guy who we play as and who we hope succeeds. The opposite of a protagonist is an antagonist. Their job in the story is to oppose the protagonist in some way. These two things can be implemented in so many different and interesting ways, but at a really basic level you've got the good guy versus the bad guy, which crops up in media all the time. I'm a big believer that to make this type of framework compelling, you can't neglect the characterization of the antagonist. But it is pretty easy to do just that. After all, the protagonist is the one the audience is supposed to root for, and is the one they spend the most time with. This focus means they often end up as a far more realised and interesting character than their antagonist. In the worst cases, this renders the antagonist as nothing more than an obstacle for the hero to overcome. That makes the entire conflict between the two of them far less interesting for the audience to experience. To get around this, a piece of media has to put more attention on its antagonists, and this usually means making the audience spend more time with them. In Avengers Infinity War, the main villain Thanos has 31 minutes of screen time. That might not sound like a lot, but he's actually the character with the most amount of screen time of the entire cast, with the runner-up only having 20 minutes by comparison. This extra time gave the audience way more opportunity to understand his history and motivations, and gain a view into the philosophy driving his actions. The result was that he's generally considered to be the best antagonist present in any of the Marvel Universe movies. Similarly, in A Song of Ice and Fire, the members of the Lannister family serve as the antagonists for the Stark family early in the story, but we get whole chapters from the perspectives of Tyrion, Jaime and Cersei to help us understand who they are as people, resulting in an incredibly compelling story. But you'll notice these two good examples of stories spending time with their antagonists aren't video games. There's plenty of great villains in video games of course, but generally speaking, because of the way the medium works, it's a lot harder to have the audience spend significant time with their antagonists. The vast majority of games are told entirely from the perspective of one character who you control throughout the entire experience. If you're not in some sort of cutscene and have full control over the character, the logical thing for you to do when encountering an antagonist is to try and stop them. But you can't be allowed to do this unless it's at the specific point the game designers plan, for obvious story, narrative and gameplay reasons. Usually, this means that most of the antagonist's character development is done through cutscenes, but these present other issues. Most people enjoy playing games for the interactivity and control they offer when compared to other mediums, so to fill a game with long, character development cutscenes using techniques from film and television isn't always desirable. And yes, I'm aware of the irony of making this point in a video about Metal Gear. The other antagonist building technique of having the audience experience part of the story from their perspective is pretty hard to pull off in games. If you spend some time playing as the protagonist and come to root for them, then you're not going to have any motivation or desire to help the antagonist progress with their goals if you suddenly switch to playing as them. In Metal Gear Rising, the main antagonists throughout the game are the members of the private military company Desperado, who serve as bosses throughout the game. Some of these antagonists pop up several times, but in general, you don't get to see much of them before you have to fight and defeat them. Given that, it sounds as though the game might suffer from some of the difficulties in developing interesting characters I just described. But this is where the music comes in, or more specifically, the lyrics written for each of the main villain's tracks. It's often the case that soundtracks for video games are largely instrumental. The goal of a soundtrack is usually to enhance the experience and get the player to have a specific emotional response. 
Because it's enhancing what's already happening on screen, a vocal layer isn't really necessary most of the time. Take the recent Doom soundtracks as an example of this. The tracks that play during combat are setting out to evoke feelings of power and strength. The instrumentals alone manage this, so why bother adding a vocal element to them? The few tracks that do have lyrics are just chanting and gibberish. It's there to make you feel like there's a crowd cheering you along your destructive path, thus making you feel even more of a badass. In the Metal Gear Rising soundtrack, the instrumentals set out to achieve a similar goal of making you feel empowered. And they achieve it. The tracks are heavy, fast and frenetic, perfectly synced with the gameplay and resulting in you the player feeling like a really cool cyborg ninja. But that's just the thing. The instrumental versions of the track achieved the goal. A vocal layer could add to the feeling even more, but it wasn't necessary. It would just be a cherry on the top. But instead of stopping there, the composers asked what else could a vocal performance add to the experience? And the answer was to provide characterization. In the case of the antagonists fought as boss battles, this allows for a massive opportunity. Because each boss has their own unique vocal track, there's an opportunity for the lyrics to focus solely on each character as individuals. Through this, you often get an insight into their history and their emotional state, both in a general sense and in the present moment of the fight. Let's take Blade Wolf as an example of this. Raiden encounters him in a cutscene just before the fight starts. There's some basic exposition and back and forth quips between the two, and then the boss battle begins. There's not much time to set him up as a character, and he runs the risk of being one of those paper-thin antagonists we talked about earlier, a temporary roadblock who exists only to slow down our protagonist briefly. His track is of course snappy and exhilarating, but take a listen to the lyrics. These tell us so much more about Blade Wolf's character, that for his entire existence he's been a tool of Desperado, knowing nothing but violence under their orders. Instead of being on board with it, as we might assume, he hates this life he leads and is desperate to break free of their chains and go about life on his own terms, as his own individual in full control of his destiny. It's so much more information than we received in the brief cutscene beforehand, and makes Blade Wolf so much more than just a robot dog placed mid-level to check if the player has learned to parry yet. Blade Wolf is a little different to the other antagonists in that later in the story he switches to Raiden's team, but even with the extra opportunities for development this gave, I think the vocal layer of his theme is still the strongest moment of characterization for him. And this is true of the other antagonists' themes too. Mistral, Monsoon and Armstrong all have their characterization supplemented by the lyrics on their vocal tracks. But my absolute favourite usage of this technique, and the one I think is the smartest implementation, is the theme of Jetstream Sam. And to understand why, we first have to talk about the first Halo novel. In my version, on page 252, there's this line that reads, The Master Chief got scared all the time. He never showed it though. He usually mentally acknowledged the apprehension, put it aside, and continued, just as he's been trained to. This time, however, he couldn't easily dismiss the feeling. This sentence has stuck with me since I read it because it's so completely different from the impression you get while playing the game. Especially in the first three, Master Chief comes across as this unstoppable, no-nonsense tank of a guy. This kind of characterization makes him far more human and relatable. I'd shit myself several times over if I was him. But in the games themselves, Chief's primary purpose is to exist in such a way that the player has fun, and the way Bungie set out to do that was to embrace the badass, power fantasy side of him. And the truth is that it's hard to balance these two conflicting character elements, especially given the limited perspectives that video games can have. The novel was able to get away with it by putting the vulnerable side of Chief within his own head, and then allowing us to hear his thoughts. If he was to say something like that out loud in the game during combat, there's a disconnect between what the player's hearing from the character and what they're making them do. 
And once that disconnect happens, it's a lot harder to get invested in a character and even harder to win back that feeling of connection. And with that in mind, let's talk about Jetstream Sam. Sam is the antagonist to Raiden in the truest form of the word. We first encounter him right at the start of the game, where he effortlessly thrashes us and leaves Raiden one limb lighter. He then serves as a recurring rival throughout the game, popping up to cause trouble several times before a final showdown in the desolate desert. Sam embodies swagger and bravado. The first time we see him is when an armor truck points a heavy machine gun straight at him, to which he responds with an incredibly defiant, cheesy, shit-eating grin. When he speaks, it's often light and jovial. He chats about matters of life and death with a grin on his face, and to him, there's no situation too dark for a joke. It projects pure confidence, and that's what his theme conveys when we hear it the first time. This is in the first section of the game, in a battle the player is destined to lose. There's no lyrics here, so the track is just trying to achieve that first goal we talked about earlier of evoking a response from the player. And it achieves it. It sounds really heavy and dangerous, matching the situation and what we've seen of Sam so far. Again, this is right at the start of the game when you're probably still trying to grasp how all of the controls work, adding to the panic and impending doom of the fight for Raiden. After Raiden loses, we don't hear the track again until the final duel between the two later in the game, and it's only now that we hear the lyrics too. By this point, Raiden's overcome the other generals of Desperado, and Sam is one of the last obstacles preventing him from stopping their plan to cause worldwide chaos. So, what do the lyrics have to say for the swaggering, confident badass that we the players see Sam as? Well, it goes like this. These lyrics are the antithesis to everything we know about Sam up to this point, or rather, everything we thought we knew about him. They paint a picture of a man whose entire life and identity is being held together by threads that feel ready to snap at any given moment. Sam's purpose in the game was to be Raiden and the player's rival, a powerful enemy who they have to really work hard to defeat. To fill that role well, Sam needed to come across as incredibly powerful, and showing him brimming with confidence in his own ability was a good way of doing that. But to make him more than a two-dimensional obstacle, he needed more character traits, and this inner conflict regarding his own morals and actions was a perfect way of making him more interesting. It makes you want to know more about him. Why is he feeling this way? Was it something that Raiden, and by extension us, did? Could we find some way to get him to act on these feelings and switch sides? I think the desire to ask questions like this means the character and narrative succeeded in getting us invested enough to be interested in hearing possible answers, which, like we mentioned before, is especially impressive because they managed to do that with an antagonist. But these vulnerable traits directly contradict those of his primary purpose of being a seemingly unstoppable badass. It's the same characterization issue that the Halo series had to use a book to solve. And that's why it was such a smart idea to have this instead take place in the lyrics of his theme. One of the big strengths of the written medium is the things writers can do by having the reader directly hear what the characters are thinking and feeling, instead of relying solely on what they say and infer. The composers here have found a way to translate that storytelling technique into a video game in an absolutely incredible way. But it doesn't stop there. During the fights, Sam loses his sword and takes on Raiden barehanded. During these moments, the lyrics cut out completely and only start again when he picks his sword back up. I've got two interpretations of this. The first is that the sword is a symbol for all of the people he's killed and the bad deeds he's done serving Desperado. 
The inner conflict described in the lyrics is a result of these actions, so them disappearing when he drops the sword implies that if he stops fighting, or at least stops fighting for Desperado, his conflict will disappear and he can be at peace. The second interpretation is that because he's lost his weapon, he has to concentrate more on the fight itself, and he becomes so concentrated on the present moment that his inner thoughts are quieted. You could say then that the danger of the fight is the only way he knows how to quiet these thoughts in his head, and that unhealthy coping mechanism has led to him needing to fight stronger and stronger foes and ending up in this situation. You don't have to agree with either of these. The point is more that the game got me to think this way at all, and it did that just by the simple action of removing lyrics from a song when certain gameplay conditions are met. Video games are a great medium for storytelling, in part thanks to how they're able to draw so many different techniques from other mediums, the big three being writing, visual or art design, and music. It often feels like the first two get the most attention when it comes to making a game, and serve as the core base that the music can then enhance or improve upon. But games have the potential to do so much more with their music. There are so many opportunities to leverage soundtracks in truly unique ways to not just elevate or enhance the experience, but to convey narrative and story elements that otherwise wouldn't be possible. And that's why, as cheesy as it is at times, I love the soundtrack of Metal Gear Rising, and think it's a lot smarter than it gets credit for.